Hey guys, welcome to the Daily Word Bible Study, a plain and simple, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and book by book study of the entire Bible currently. We're in Job chapter 32. Now, we've shifted from Job, as you remember, from chapters 3 to 31, was the discourse between Job and his three friends. Uh, and in chapter 32, we, we, we see another person enter into the, the, the dialogue. His name is Eli, um, Elihu. Uh, he is younger than them. And, and understand from the cultural perspective, um, you could be considered young at 30, 35, 40. In other words, in some cases, they didn't even kind of consider you uh, kind of on their level until after 50. But he enters in, of course, he's going to deliver one of the most profound um, pieces of wisdom. He also acts as a forerunner uh, to God, <coughs> which kind of seems to be, I don't know if, it, if I can accurately say pattern. For example, the closest I can think about is John the Baptist who came before Christ and sort of primed the pump for people, got their hearts, prepared their hearts to receive him. Um, Elahu's speech, however, is more going to echo what God is going to say in terms of rebuke, okay? So we started this, and I want to pick it up at chapter 32 again. Um, and he has kind of a few chapters um, in which he kind of takes his time, you know, <coughs> to address both Job and his friends. So I'm going to start at verse 1 again. Verse 32 says, So these three men quit answering Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. Then Elihu, son of Barachel, Barachel, uh, the, the Buzzite from the family of Ram, became angry. He was angry at Job because he had justified himself rather than God. Now, we, we kind of been seeing that throughout how Job, um, how Job had, um, he started off right. I mean, in other words, as I said, when you think about Job's predicament and you think about how he has, you know, what he suffered and, and not knowing why, right, and not knowing the why, it's kind of understandable uh, that you would, that Job would think, you know, okay, well, what, why am I suffering? I am doing everything I can to be right. Well, uh, that kind of devolved into him, but I'm right, <laughs> okay, as opposed to seeing things through God's eyes. Um, verse 3 says, um, he was also angry at Job's three friends because they had failed to refute him and yet had condemned him. And this is, by the way, very common with people in their arguments. Um, I go through it all the time. Um, and, you know, whether it's dealing with different denominations, Calvinism, Church of Christ, Catholicism. Um, when people want to refute, they oftentimes kind of assume you are refuting them on the same level they are. Now, in my case, I just, 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 I just want to know what the scripture says. Let's talk about the scriptures. And it was interesting that they would do exactly the same thing. They will, they will fail to refute, but then yet still, and I'm going to say in this case, hold to their position. Job's three friends just for some reason turned on him. You, you, you even have to ask the question, well, why did you even bother to make the trip? You could have made these kind of condemnations among yourselves without coming. You could have said, well, Job got what he deserved, right? And in a sense, that's basically what they were saying. That Come on, Job. You know, do you, you, know, you, you know you did something wrong to deserve this type of um, uh, adversity. Uh, verse 4. Now... Elihu had waited to speak to Job because they were all older than he. But when he saw that these three men could not answer Job, he became angry. 
So Elihu, son of Barachel, the Buzzite, replied, I am, I am young in years while you are old. Now, as I said, he could have been 40, close to even 50. And they would, they, back then in the kind of this culture, they really considered that, they really considered that uh, uh, young. Okay. He said, I'm young in years while you are old. Therefore, I was timid and afraid to tell you what I know. I thought that age should speak and maturity should teach wisdom. But it is a man's, it is a man's, it, I'm sorry, but it is a spirit in man and the breath of the Almighty that gives him understanding. Now, this, this is really absolutely true, of course. Something we kind of don't like because oftentimes when you're young and you acquire knowledge, and I know because I acquired a lot of knowledge when I was young, but I did not have wisdom. I learned a lot. I learned a whole lot, uh, but didn't have wisdom. Um, and even now, some of you young people would think, well, how come people don't listen to me? Because you don't have wisdom. You may have knowledge, but you don't have wisdom. Now, at the same time, the elderly, and as I kind of have joined the ranks of the elderly, can have to recognize, yes, it is always that God can give anyone wisdom. If you kind of stop and think about it, Solomon was given his wisdom at the age of 40. When he take women, when he took king, he was given it. God had given him wisdom. All right, verse nine. Um, it is, it is, it is not only the old who are wise or the elderly who understand how to judge. Therefore, I say, listen to me. I will declare what I know. Now, of course, he's absolutely right because, again, one of the things you have to understand is that wisdom comes from God. Now, in a kind of natural sense, wisdom can come from what? Experience. Um, I'm much wiser now because of the stupid mistakes that I've made all right, in my younger years. Uh, verse 11, look, I waited for your conclusions. I listened to your insights as you sought for words. I paid close attention to you. Yet no one proved Job wrong. Not one of you refuted his arguments, which is true. And we also gotta have to remember, we have to remember and even, I'm going to say at this point, probably including Elihu, which is, to me, I think, might be one of the reasons why God is kind of prepping this, kind of paving the way. Remember, hitherto, we're seeing this from a human perspective. We're seeing this from man's point of view, how they would view things. Job's friends did not know, of course, even Job himself, and I'm going to assume even Elihu did not receive the revelation that from chapters 1 and 2, the heavenly scene. So they're, they're, they're speaking based upon, in a sense, what they see, what they know, which is, okay, uh, just shouldn't happen anyway. Um, verse 13. So do not claim we have found wisdom let God deal with him, not man. Now, they couldn't refute his argument. They just kind of kept arguing that he was wrong. Again, pure human. <laughs> but Job has not directed his argument to me. And I will not respond to him with your arguments. Now, this is some wisdom here being dropped by this young man. Job's friends are dismayed and can no longer answer. Words have left them. Should I continue to wait now that they are silent? Now that they stand there and no longer answer? Now remember at the beginning of the chapter, we understand why the narrator preferenced this. They just kind of concluded, well, he's, he's righteous in his own arm. And it's a false kind of narrative there, isn't it? 
The, the real reason is that they, they didn't have an answer to refute him. And despite the fact that they didn't have an answer to refute him, they did not conclude, well, you know, maybe we're wrong. Maybe we have the wrong insight. They just, not nah, Job's wrong. So now Elihu is rebuking him. You, you just didn't have an answer because you don't have an answer. Verse 16 again. Should I continue to wait now that they're silent, now that they stand there and no longer answer? I too, I too will answer. Yes, I will tell you what I know. For I am full of words, and my spirit compels me to speak. My heart is like un, unvented wine. It is about to burst like new wineskins. I must speak so that I could find relief. I must open my lips and respond. I will be partial to no one. Um, okay, my screen is freaking out again. All right, guys, let me go to my, I'm going to be reading because my screen froze up here. Um, verse 21. Oh. All right, come on. All right, here we go. It's unfroze. All right. He said, I must speak so that I can find relief. I must open my lips and respond. I will be partial to no one. And that's, to me, one of the greatest positions to have. Whenever I talk about anything, people find it hard to believe that I said I have no dog in the hunt. In other words, I am not defending in the denomination, I'm not defending um, a theological point of view. I strictly want to. Um, I strictly want to <laughs> to present God's word. And and again, I find the, the the kind of principles that he's speaking here as they apply to sometimes when I make these arguments, they can't refute it. When I they they, they sidestep. Anyway, I, I'm going off rails here. Verse 21 again, I will be partial to no one. I will not give up anyone. I will not give anyone an undeserved title, for I do not know how to give such titles. Otherwise, my maker would remove me in an instant. Now, um, he's talking about their complaint against Job. Their um, not even knowing why Job believed what he believes. Verse, uh, chapter 32 and verse 1. But now, Job, pay attention to my speech and listen to all my words. I'm going to open my mouth. My tongue will form words on my palate and my words come from my upright heart and my lips speak with sincerity what they know. <laughs> Excuse me. The Spirit of God has made me and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. Refute me if you can. Prepare your case against me. Now, keep keep this kind of phraseology here in mind because this is, as I said, you're going to see God's going to kind of use the same language. That's why I say Elihu seems certainly to be the forerunner. <laughs> okay? Uh, the forerunner of God. Verse 5 again. Refute me if you can. But pray your case against me. Take your stand. I am just like you before God. I was also pinched off from a piece of clay. Fear me. Uh, fear, uh, fear of me should not terrify you. The pressure I exert against you will be light. Surely you have spoken in my hearing, and I have heard these very words. I am pure without transgression. See, I am clean and have no guilt. But he finds reason to oppose me. He regards me as his enemy. He puts my feet in stocks. He stands watch over my path. But I tell you that you are wrong in this manner. Since God is greater than man, why do you take him to court? For not answering anything a person asks. Now this is kind of interesting because notice what he says right here. Why do you take God to court for not answering anything he asks? Now, that said, a lot of people charge God with things, you know, but they don't have information. 
Okay. Verse 14, for God speaks time and time again, but a person may not notice it in a dream, in a vision in the night, when deep sleep falls on people as they slumber in their beds. Now, this is kind of interesting to me because one of the arguments people will make, just one of them, and there's a whole lot of them we could go through here, but one of them is that and in fact, I'm thinking about a, a particular preacher who left his Pentecostal background to become kind of a universalist. And his, the reason is he's watching these African people at night. And then he he, he, he asks God, he says, um, well, God, why are you sending these people to hell? Kind of a stretch right there. But the point is that he's asking that as if, I mean, God hasn't tried to reach them, that God is sending them to hell. He's asking a whole lot of stuff without the benefit of knowing or knowledge. In other words, we oftentimes say, well, God, why did, you, why did you let me suffer like this? And you're asking that as if maybe God didn't attempt to reach you. When I think about when I think about when I went through prostate cancer and I thought to myself, man, why did this happen to me? And the thoughts did, the thoughts did enter, enter into my mind, but they were immediately followed by, hmm, let's see, for all those years, your poor diet, poor exercise, just, just that alone that could have contributed to that. Or how about this, the fact that really I did not go to the doctors. I got one of the best health care plans that I never hardly used. I mean, see, my point is this. There were a lot of answers that could that 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 are out there. In other words, when I say, "Well, God, did you try to? Why didn't you tell me?" Besides the fact that God did, you know, when I finally went. Anyway, so there's a lot of things. I mean, we we can we could go through, and I, we we don't have the answers. Like for example, you look at here's the once you go back now at this point, over 20 years, 9/11. It's etched in my mind. You think about, did God, could God have saved the people on those airplanes that crashed into the World Trade Center? In other words, once they got on the planes, in a sense, their, 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 their future was, it was sealed, doomed, right? Once they shut the door. I don't know. Could God have tried to tell them not to get on the plane? Here's my point. We don't know. And it would be foolish to try to even offer answers to that. Because there were innocent people, guilty people, right? All people deserving of it. We can go all... Anyway, verse 16. He uncovers their ears at the time and terrifies them with warnings in order to turn a person from his actions. And supply and suppress his pride. Let me read that again. He uncovers their ear at time at the time and terrifies them with warnings in order to turn a person from his actions and suppress his pride. God spares his soul from the pit, his life from crossing the river of death. A person may be disciplined on his bed with pain and constant distress in his bones, so that. Um, so that he detests bread and his soul despises his favorite food. His flesh wastes away to nothing and his unseen bones stick out. He draws near to the pit and his life to the executioner. If there is an angel on his side, one mediator out of a thousand, to tell a person what is right for him and to be gracious to say, I mean, gracious to him and say, spare him from going down to the pit. I found a ransom. Then his flesh will be healthier than in his youth. And he will return to the days of his youthful vigor. He will pray to God and answer with delight in him. That man will see his face with a shout of joy. And God will restore his righteousness to him. He will look at men and say, I have sinned. And perverted what was right. Yet, I did not get what I deserved. And that is true. We never get what we deserve. 
And in, in fact, that's kind of a starting place for all man, that we never get what we deserve. He redeemed my soul from going down to the pit, and I will continue to, to see the light. God certainly does all these things two or three times to a man in order to turn him back from the pit so he may shine with the light of life. Pay attention, Job, and listen to me. Be quiet, and I will speak. But if you have something to say, answer me. Speak, for I would like to justify you. If not, then listen to me. Be quiet, and I will teach you wisdom. Now, of course, he's saying this because in the culture, um, in the culture, they find it very hard for him to say, right? They find it very hard for him to say that a young man like that could teach wisdom. And yet, so far, he's dropping the mic with wisdom. All right, guys, we'll pick it up in the next study. Don't forget to like and share this video and subscribe to BP, the Bible Perspective. And as always, if you have a thought or comment, add it to the comment section below. All comments are welcome. Till next time, I see you in the next study.